Good evening. It's Joyful Hermit. Early evening. Um, <clears throat> had quite a day of it. Woke up with unexpected uh, pain. Lovey, I can't help it, honey. Just going to have to wait. Michelle's coming later. Michelle will come back. Um, anyway, I've had horrific pain. Um, intestinal and I still am but it's going to take a bit to get this get this worked out and uh <laughs> literally I guess or, and just the effects of it on the abdomen I literally my intestines feel as if they have been shredded run through a paper shredder and it's not over uh but it's the obviously the worst of it because I was in bad shape. I had to call my neighbor and she wasn't home this morning. I called her and I got up and it just hit. I got up okay. I was getting the pups their, their breakfast and it it just hit all of a sudden uh, and was excruciating. Uh, and my neighbor understood. I mean, later she said, you know, you know, that I was, uh, couldn't help but to scream and moan. Um, it's just your physical body takes over and you can't control what utterances you make even when you're in that kind of pain. And she said, do you take your pills? I said, I've already taken, but... I, I obviously had to take more just to help the pain. Lovey, I'm sorry, honey. Michelle will come later. She's going to come later. So she came after she got home. In the meantime, I had called, uh, called this other young man who lives around the corner. Wonderful soul. And um, so I have, I have an LDS person and a Catholic person. He's Catholic and she's LDS and he was sick. Sean was sick, sounded terrible. But then he texted a little bit later and when Michelle had gotten here and said, you know, even my grandmother would come over or, or we'll call the ambulance for you. But my neighbor already wanted to call the ambulance even when she was out somewhere and answered my phone call because she could tell I was in a bad way. But I said no um, because generally it, you, know, you don't want to be moved, um, transported anywhere. And they don't, they don't generally give you pain medication uh, until they have you assessed at the ER. And I knew it's just, you know, another massive pain siege of the type that I've had for the last, since the pump was in, but and definitely the last year. But I hadn't been in ER since early February. Or, yeah, or had one of these. I think, I don't even remember when was the last time I was in ER, but um, they were so busy, and then I had accident there i was in agony there and other people uh concerned you know and they didn't have a room available yet and well then when i had the accident they suddenly had a room but some room that maybe that hadn't been used or something or they don't tend to use but they stuffed me in a room but it it's just pain and uh the intestines stop even though I'm taking this supplement. Um, but with arachnoiditis, eventually your intestines shut down and you don't have motility. And so uh, it's very painful. And But for whatever reason, the supplement that my daughter had found from pickleball players, they use it. It's very helpful for joints. S- B, P, I think, something like that, hyphen 157. Now, Amazon doesn't have it. They have a 159. It's not the same. 
Got to get the 157. E epoxy, epoxy or something like that carries it online. It's $126 if you go on their subscription plan for 60 capsules. And it has helped me very much with motility. Um, that wasn't the main thing that it's supposed to help with, but they have found that it does um, and helps with intestinal healing and motility. They did experiments on rats and saw that it helped with motility. It's not approved by the FDA. At my point, who cares? <laughs> um, but it generally has helped with motility, but for some reason... And that's how my suffering gets at times. God utilizes suffering at times. It, it, there is a spiritual element to suffering. When it's something that is temporal, a temporal suffering, but doesn't make sense. My pain doctor, the, the uh, digestive people, specialists, what they're called with gut issues uh they they haven't been able to figure it out obviously you know it's just um but i'm so blessed i haven't had one of these attacks in a long time but I, i'm so much better now even though i i'm not good enough to really get up and tend the my little sweeties yeah, I'll try after this, but I wanted to talk about um, this, you know, that God, how God utilizes sufferings and, and allows them. And often I have noticed over 40 years of suffering and being a victim soul of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was my response to God, I agreed when asked, I agreed um, to suffer for, for Christ and for whatever God wills, to offer my sufferings in whatever way. And so today, of course, I offered this suffering for this one person and all the people like that person. And it, one of the viewers um Angela hit it on the spiritual nail head um, that the problem is it's it's a docker docker um, floater situation just different types but that so many people are stuck in a more temporal uh, thoughts uh, from themselves um, their views, their interpretations, their uh, ways instead of God's, instead of the Trinity, His real presence, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and the Virgin Mary as being the type, the type um, to represent that our our humanity on earth and how we could be how we could become she had the virgin mary has graces that are beyond any other human being ever born but they are not precluded from us god does not say you cannot you cannot be like that you cannot grow you know, he wants us to grow spiritually and to be led by God and by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the Virgin Mary is sort of our human example of a pattern, of a type of person, of a type of being that we can be. Um, all the names for Mary... I was looking them up. I wrote all this in a comment with Angela, a response, and then more with JJ. I wrote also on this thought, these thoughts, but um, Mary inviolable. You know, she is inviolable. 
And we are to be that in God. It's only through God, through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus that we can, through pure love. That's the only way. And through the numinous of the Holy Spirit and of God and of Jesus. So not through the temporal. These matters are of a different nature. And it's how it will all be when we die, when we're on the other side. We're not going to have this temporal anymore. And uh, it behooves us to um, get on that path in life. John the Baptist's ancestors, the Essenes, lived a very pure life. The air, the trees, the colors, the uh, sounds, everything was very pure uh, in earlier centuries of John the Baptist's ancestors. Lovey, honey, you're okay. Michelle gave you treats. She took you out. Everything's fine. And in a little, I will try myself to get you up if I can. You know, I'm not, I'm not feeling well today. The puppies were so scared. Mercy got just frantic, but I couldn't do anything. Lovey, no barky, no barky. But it's, um, so all this thing, I've been put into a crucible with my spiritual life. It came to a crux, a crux, a cross, a crossing point of what was going to be the path. And I've had to make a, a, a choice of God, of course. And that's okay. Um, and, and God is fine with it. I am... Um, I'm going to continue on with my mission. Why I was sent back in 1987 to rear my children, which I've done, and to fulfill my mission, which I think is just sharing my life, my spiritual journey, and all the blessings I've had through suffering, through tremendous suffering like today. Uh, it was horrific suffering <laughs> and still is not so great. But it's, um, I have been blessed by like the spiritual Don, my spiritual director, and how things he taught me, and the my parents leaving money to my sisters and myself. So that I, the first thing I did with some of them, well, one of the first things is I went on a pilgrimage to Fatima, but more than that, I got these uh, books, um, excellent books um, of spiritual knowledge and teaching from way, way back. And I want to share these things with others, with you guys. So that's what I'm going to continue doing and then also, love each. he's okay. I want to assure everybody, he's okay. He's not suffering. He's just making noise because he, he wants out. He wants F-O-O-D. He's very, very orally um, motivated. Lovey. Now, the moaning isn't going to change things, and you're not, you're not hurt, honey. Now, this morning, Mommy was hurting. So that's why I moaned. <laughs> but um, so um, Angela said it right, you know, that we get stuck in human nonsense. Human nonsense. And we've got to open up totally to God and to his pure love, his guidance. When I say God, I include Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And... Trust, trust in that, and don't be naive about evil. Um, the evil one does things that aren't good, and we need to learn how the evil one operates. 
and the connection between the spiritual and the temporal. Like my shredded, my shredded intestines, they feel shredded. That kind of pain of just totally shredded. And that is like a, an image that God is giving me for how my spirit was felt shredded. Shredded by this, this ongoing silliness, really silliness. And um, to the point where I had to choose God and Christianity over Catholic Church. I realized I wasn't leaving. I was being pushed <laughs> to a point where I had no choice other than to uh, live the spiritual of God is pure love. And in my heart, I'm still of the faith. And in my soul, I still am. Lovey. Lovey, I can't, I can't really get up even if I would stop talking. We have to wait for Michelle. Michelle's going to come. She's out to supper with her, with her husband and brother-in-law. So we have to wait. We have to wait. Be patient, honey. So it's, it's, um, God is opening up uh, just a, a new tributary. Say it's a big stream. God's church. And already there's many tributaries. Jesus says, in my house are many rooms. Or in my house there are many mansions. He even uses that word. There's all these different churches. All these different. And the Catholic church was the original but human sin tends to, you know, we always divide off. It's a shame that we, we end up dividing ourselves. But God works it out. And uh, so we, we just go on. It's like this big stream. Or the, we'll go back to the corridor that I saw in vision. The night before I was, convert, I was con uh, confirmed as a Catholic. Jesus showed me this corridor with all these rooms off to the side, filled with tables to study and to read and to learn. It's like it's this huge long corridor, and all these books were in them and things to see and to learn spiritually and about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's what gave me this impetus when I finally had some money to use um, Bishop, Archbishop Adolf Tanqueray's book, The Spiritual Life, that ha published in 1930. It was used in seminaries, but it is a thorough book of the mystical and the, um, what do you call it? I don't know. I can't think of the words, but of, of um, the spiritual life and the mystical life. So we can, you can read that book. It, it gives a great foundation. In the back, I saw this, well, so many of the thoughts were so rich. And so I would, and I would see these little notations. I looked in the index then, and there was this incredible index in bibliography of all the citations that Tanqueray had taken information from. And the books and the authors were listed. So I used that as my guide on the books I would purchase. I'd find them online used mostly. Some of them were out of print. That's why. And then I had this big idea as a hermit that people would come. I think hermits all get bitten by that. But if that happens, it's usually when you're, you know, 40 years into your vocation or something, you're at the end of your life. And it's all, it's not because of the habit you wear or because you've told people you're a hermit. No, it's because God allows it. And all of a sudden, um, there's something about you that exudes Jesus Christ. 
And that's what draws people. So I thought, well, people then would want to borrow these books mm -hmm. and learn mm -hmm. more in depth of the spiritual life of the great mm -hmm. mysterium tremendum of God, of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. of the mystery of God, of what makes mm -hmm. God God, what makes the Holy Spirit spirit, spiritual, what makes Jesus mm -hmm as he is and 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 where he is now well right here he could be standing right here probably prefer looking out on the pond in the gardens i call this one lake immaculata it's okay to use the same names if you've had to move i need a name for my front porch and the door it's it's going to be something to do with the virgin mary because of the uh color mysterious which is more blue than what more blue than the black i thought it's going to be supposed to be more of a blackish navy so dark you could barely tell but it's really coming out more blue and i've got to get a different kind of paint because brush marks were showing and and i've painted for years and so that somehow that type of paint or the sheen isn't right so I need this door to be Mary. <laughs> I can't have flaws in it. In other words, she didn't. So I, I connect everything spiritually because that's, that's the way. That's the reality. All is spiritual. Even my little pups are spiritual beings, creatures. God gave them to me to help me. To, like even this morning, I was up until this hit. Hit. And then little Mercy was frantic and Lovey was worried. And and um, so anyway, uh, and then they got, I'd fed them, just fed them and it hit. So, and I could tell something was off. I, I knew myself not to eat, but I'd fix some hot almond milk. And that somehow triggered it then when I started drinking that. So who knows? But it's even this suffering is mysterious in a way. Of It didn't hit in the normal way. Usually I have precursors of it. But it is in itself a typecast of what is going on in my spiritual and temporal life right now. And it's as if God is using this suffering to reassure me that I'm okay as a Christian hermit. That that's, I think he prefers that than I get entangled with people who are rather stuck in the temporal interpretations of the canon law and who have made up protocols and precedents. Granted, someone always does, no matter what. Um, I didn't realize until I read a little more about St. Vincent de Paul on the 27th, his feast day, 27th of September, that he was the one who, in the, what would it be, the 1600s, who, who changed the church's way. He, he got it through that priests had to be, be taken over years before they could be priests, not the weeks and couple of months up until that time. Oh, that's not long enough for a priest to be prepared, most, most of them. There are exceptions always. Older priests who come along who've been tremendously spiritual all their lives and, and were in other lines of work, and had a call later in life. Mm -hmm. And they can be some of the best priests because they have all this life experience and experience in suffering and experience with, with women, with, with having fallen in love and, and not following through with that. Not, or, and some of them are, they have some now from other, like Anglicans, Dwight Longenecker, was an Anglican priest, and he was taken in. 
he became Catholic and is allowed to be a priest. And he has a wife and family. That's a rare exception. The, the Holy Father, I think that would have been John Paul too, maybe at the time, allowed that. Or it might have been this one, uh, Francis, maybe allowed that. And with others. And um, so it's an exception to the rule. And that's okay. I don't think we should get so rigid that there's never any exceptions either. But it always has to be grounded in God is pure love in the spiritual truth, beauty and goodness of God. And, um, and not taken lightly. But that's just a, that, that is a human-made law or precedent that for now the priests are not to be married and be priests. And had, had uh, I guess be Father Long, Long and Necker now, had he married after, that, that wouldn't have worked. You, you can't, there's not an exception if you're already a priest and then you decide you want to be married. No, 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 they don't, that doesn't work. Um, but back in, before 1000 approximately, the year 1000, um, there, they had married priesthood. So that's, I don't want to get off on that too much, but just to show how things evolve or change or humans, uh, set precedents and set rules, I guess rules, within the church structure. And those rules can be changed or altered. But with this hermit vocation, see the bishops back in 83, they didn't fill in all the gaps. And they probably should have. They, they should have had maybe a subcommittee go through, you know, how, what are, how are the details of how this is going to work. This Canon Law 603 is going to flesh it out and write out all that. Instead, they left a void and someone filled it with their views of how it should be and made it very, it's very logical and it's okay. I think it, it would be okay. I just would prefer if a clergy had done it because it's the clergy, it's the bishops who are to be approving uh, uh, hermits. And they would be far more familiar with hermit life had they been the ones to set these rules, these temporal means and ways of how we actually live it out. Um, and then there wouldn't have been questions about uh, being a private hermit then. And I wouldn't have ever been a private hermit then private Catholic hermit. I would have, I tried to be approved and the bishop, they didn't want to be bothered with it at that time in 2007. 2012, he was busy with his retirement vets, um, parties and dinners out and receptions and things. He said he didn't have time then, even though he said he would do whatever I wanted. Reminded me of Herod, you know, and, and um, offering the girl, you know, if you dance, I'll, I'll grant you any wish you want, you know. But Herod followed through. He followed through. That was noble of him, but horrific, horribly sinful. He shouldn't have followed through on something so, so heinous and sinful. But I always looked at it that God kept choosing, that he did not want me to be connected with the temporal uh, canon law, at least in the way that it was being uh, uh, laid out in the in the fleshed out in the details, or how other people were being approved, who maybe and then not supervised or um, given maybe more free reign with it. But in the full picture, it doesn't matter. They're living together. They're starting communities, religious orders, laws. See, those fell, fell away in the Middle Ages because they weren't evidently, you know, not 
not fruitful enough. The most fruitful is to live in, like with me today and this morning. And yes, I finally, I did have to call for help, but I learned so much in the interim, so much reliance on God, and, and he shown me this overlay of how the actual type of suffering of my shredded intestines are sort of like he has shredded this whole mess of this other situation of the, the detractions and the 17 years of being stalked and, and a type of bullying and things. Um, he just shredded it all up through suffering. And then I offered all this suffering for that person and for others who are like inclined of getting so focused on a temporal law, man-made, man-contrived, canon law and it's not that it's a bad law it's a good one i think it's going to be great maybe another hundred years it'll all be uniform and people will comply with it and they'll either have the things that they're not doing taken out of the law so it won't be hypocritical or in conflict and it'll it'll work out okay in the end you know i'm assuming in the end um but for now all of that uh, ugliness, God just shredded up. He shredded it. And it, uh, like my intestines feel literally shredded and torn inside. And, um, and so it's, and the, and the nexus of it, or the locus of it is my lumbar, is, is from my arachnoiditis radiating. Um, so it's, but it's not been this horrific in the past. It's, uh, but it's a direct correlation. And I'm so grateful because God is showing me that all that other is as if you take a document that is, has all kinds of awful on it and you run it through a paper shredder. It's never coming back. No one will ever be able to read it you shouldn't even bother thinking about it it's gone it's destroyed god destroyed all that ugliness and he is going to heal me with my intestines um they'll eventually feel better i hope i'm sure they will um and if not you know then that's this will always be a reminder of this moment of how god is in charge and god weighs in his rule, his law, his church, it's his church, it's how he wants it. That's what matters. And I will continue living the hermit law in the way that, that God has, ha has blessed all these hermits of yore, the ancient ones who had lived observable over time even. Maybe they weren't even known in their time period, much like Mary of Egypt. But later on, the beauty of her life, of her repentance, of her, her uh, God anointing her, Mary of Egypt, that's the one I'm talking about, um, just her, her solitude, her, she had communion once in 38 years, but she was fed by the angels. Mary Magdalene, Lazarus and Martha's uh, sister, they all went after Christ's crucifixion. This is, this is um, not just tradition, but it's been written, you know, different documents historically um, that are hard to come by, but... Um, I found a real old little book on this. And cl the closer you get to the time period of writers, in general, you'll have more accuracy, but not necessarily so. But others concur. They went to the, they sailed to the south of France, to the area called Gaul, G-A-U-L. And Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, became a hermit. She lived up in a cave, the cave of St. Balm, a previous hermit. 
B-A-U-M-E, lived in his cave. He had died. And Lazarus and Martha, when well, Martha died really not too long after they got there. But Lazarus, for, for as long as he lived, brought food and provisions to Mary and communion when he could. He brought Eucharist to her. But for the most part, she went without. But uh, other hermits in the area, one of them saw one time an angel talking with her and giving her the host. Um, so even that, um, we God reaches in in ways that we we some of us can't some can't fathom because they're so temporal, so temporally minded, so docked in, um, feet down in the ground, that it's hard for them to envision other, the numinous, the spiritual to that degree and to trust in it. Uh, they can get into doubting or poo-pooing, and they feel much more comfortable with the temporal. Well, that's why Jesus had, gave us his body and his blood. He knew the bulk of people could not continue on uh, without something temporal and tangible that is consecrated. So in the Last Supper, he gave the words of consecration. He demonstrated the pattern. This is my body. This is my blood. He consecrated bread and wine. And that became the Eucharist. And that's what we have as Catholics and the Orthodox, all the different rites in the Catholic Church and in the Eastern Church, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, all these different different little mansions or little rooms in the house that will be in heaven, you know, that and and um and the Protestants, they don't have consecration. They don't believe see, they don't have that that aspect of even going that far of thinking that God can actually transubstantiate a bread 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 host and a little bit of wine or grape juice even that God cannot transubstantiate that into his actual flesh his actual blood but we can We've been taught that, and some maybe have trouble with it, but in in blind faith, go. Go forth with it. As Peter said when Jesus was asking him, you know, who do you think who do you think I am? And all this and 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 um all these other people were departing from Jesus, his other disciples were, except for the twelve. But um and some of them even maybe had some temptation to leave Jesus. But Peter said famously, Lord, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. And uh, stayed and believed. But um, the, the early hermits, the reality is, is that if they weren't priests, like Anthony of the desert, he wasn't a priest. He didn't have consecrated hosts and consecrated wine or grape juice. He went for a long time without. If someone came along that had a host, consecrated host, someone from the city, from Alexandria or other, um, maybe would give him a piece of it, a share. Um, or then would come a, a hermit who was a priest and he would celebrate Mass and consecrate then. But it was mostly um, through faith and through as Mary of Egypt where angel would give her communion. I've had that experience. Reverend Monsignor in this other diocese 
I was in so much pain. And I called. It was a Saturday morning. And I hadn't been able to be, to have communion. And I asked, and he didn't want to. He's busy. I could hear him. He was shuffling papers and doing paperwork. And that's good and fine. I then understood. I, it was disappointing because to me, if we, re and he knew about my mystical life, this was after. Even the the young the the forty year old priest that needed to be removed that was in big trouble, and so he knew that this monsignor knew. Was it even? I think was it when I'd have to look back in all my diaries. It might have even been after I already was having the ecstasy. I don't know. I don't maybe not, but it was close in that time period. But he. He didn't even offer to call. I wasn't a Eucharistic minister at the time myself. Well, I was from another parish, but I hadn't updated in the cathedral. And uh, he he didn't offer to even get anyone to bring me communion, which real I felt so strongly would have helped me endure that suffering. And uh, then I could tell he wasn't even listening to me. I would say something, and he would. I said, "Are you there? Are you there?" You know, he he put me on speakerphone, and it was just, else, you know. And so I got off the phone, and I started to cry just because of maybe it was just the sense of if there were somebody suffering like that and wanted his body and blood. I would have called any number of retired Eucharistic ministers and asked them to come bring me communion. But no. And it was just seemed like the breakdown of the faith, of the real faith, that if we really believe, and I did and I do, and, but there appeared, I was in this bed, and, and it was... It wasn't, the sun wasn't in this direction, but this nightstand right here, and off to my left, Jesus appeared and just stood. He just stood. His legs were even butted up to the side of my mattress right here. And he, hand, he handed me a host. He said nothing. He handed me a host. I opened my mouth and put out my mortal tongue, and he placed that host on my tongue. And I consumed it, I praised mm. God, and I felt strengthened, very strengthened, that I could get through. And it took away all the hurt of a type of spiritual rejection that I felt, the abandonment that I felt, because this Reverend Monsignor was my confessor then too, and my rector, and I felt like, well, if he doesn't care, who will? Jesus does. Jesus cares. But I really think, I, Jesus probably knew, I learned more by going through that alone to understand the supernatural reality of another realm. Lovey, it's okay, honey. Be soon. She went out to dinner. She'll be here probably within 15 minutes. And I'll stop talking, and then I'll see if I can get my body up. I'll see. Good luck to me. Um, no, it's not good luck. It's, it's if God wants or not. God is in charge of every aspect of our lives, whether we want to recognize that or not. And so God is reassuring me that he is pleased with my being a Christian hermit. Going forth, he's pleased that I'm going to continue sharing my spiritual experiences and my books with you and the notes I've taken and whatever else. Even like this, how, how our very sufferings, if you stop and ponder them, you will find a correlation 
between your temporal and emotional sufferings of earth and some aspect of God that he wants us to recognize and to learn and understand. And everything's connected. And it's not being goofy. It's not being weird. And, and the evil one tries to interfere. The evil one is allowed to beat on us physically and through sicknesses. And the evil one's an angel, a dark angel, a fallen angel. And was left with powers, some powers. But God is in charge of the evil one. And whatever the evil one's allowed to do to us will have some kind of connection or reason for it happening. And it's up to us to, it's like a puzzle, to put these puzzle pieces together. And it's exciting when we start putting them together. And all is well and all shall be well. Dame Julian of Norwich, call her saint. She didn't go through a, uh, uh, what's it called? When you're, when they have all the processes of making a saint a saint. I can't think of it. Um, I've got, I've got my, when you get bad pain, your fever hikes up, your blood pressure hikes up. I can't think what it's called. Um, uh, when you're beatif servant of God, then beatified, then, then see something. Uh, you all are probably shouting it at me. The word is so ordinary. Uh, anyway, uh, she was never made a saint in that kind of way, but she is. They, they determine she's a saint and call her a saint. And um, so God circumvented that, circumvented the temporal with that uh, for, for Julian of Norwich. And so it's it's okay, it, it, you know. I have to be careful not to um, get into things too much or worry about things. It's just uh, it's okay. But Julian of Norwich wasn't uh, wasn't um, canonized canonized for pity's sakes. So she wasn't, but that's what she is. And she's a saint. And so that's her life and her statement she made often in her writings. All is well and all shall be well. She had such a profound vision and uh, inpouring of the Holy Spirit at one point when she had terrible sufferings so that she... Uh, she, she felt so strongly deep within her that all is well and all shall be well. So God bless his real presence in us and, and we'll continue on in his pure love and we will um, go forth in strength of love God is pure love. And I'm going to try my best to get up and to get these sweet little creatures of God fed and uh, help, help Lovey to be consoled. He needs consoling. Mercy's, mercy's okay, but he's not so. Uh, and I'm hoping maybe later tonight I'll start in on this uh, phenomenal uh, situation that happened in Gien, France, G-I-E-N. Uh, so much in that of, of, of how God works in our lives in numinous ways. Trust, trust it, and praise God for it all. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all shall be well.